Hello everyone. For those of you who are new to the channel, I'm Eric Strong, a hospitalist, which is an internal medicine doctor who specializes in the care of hospitalized patients, including many with COVID. Today, I'm going to give you my hot take on the FDA Advisory Committee's decision yesterday about the Pfizer booster vaccine. Specifically, why they got it more or less right when they recommended against the broad use of boosters at this time. Before I get into the evidence, though, I do need to discuss up front why I was hesitant to make this video at all. I've, I've seen this phenomenon played out over the past 18 months that uh, whenever a healthcare professional uh, says something on social media like Twitter or YouTube that in any way calls into question any part of the pro-vaccine, pro-mask orthodoxy, no matter how focused and nuanced their point is, the fact that they are speaking out against the dogma brings a lot of attention from the anti-vaccine, anti-mask crowd. When these folks see a doctor speaking out against the government's position in any way, they see it as a validation of all of their views. I've seen this happen to other physicians on YouTube where a brief video covering a specific nuanced point triggers an avalanche of conspiracy theory nonsense in the comments, with folks reinforcing one another, which acts to further promote a ton of misinformation that extends well beyond the limited scope of the original video. So I want to be absolutely clear up front that by me discussing why the Pfizer booster should not be broadly administered at this time, it should not be seen as validation that the COVID vaccines in general are bad or government conspiracy of some kind or whatever. So if you are a hardcore anti-vaxxer, you know, I, I obviously don't need to uh, convince you that it's not time for the booster. So please just move on. I'm not here to validate your anti-science worldview. Instead, this video is for pro-vaccine individuals, people who eagerly received their initial vaccination and who have been anxiously awaiting news about the booster because they want to get it themselves. In the rest of this video, I'll talk about the three lines of evidence that Pfizer included in their application to the FDA to grant authorization for their booster. The FDA briefing document, which contains all the data I'll be discussing, is available to the public for free. Um, the link will be in the video description. I'll end with a discussion of how politics and science are mixing together in a dangerous way here. And because this is just a hot take and I want, this to, I want to get this info out while it still feels current, it's not going to be a particularly deep dive into the data. Um, if you think I've oversimplified any of the discussion, feel free to talk about it in the comments. The first line of evidence that Pfizer included in the application can be summarized as among people who are initially fully vaccinated, immunity against catching COVID decreases over time. Pfizer cites several studies to back up this assertion, including a retrospective cohort study from Israel in which there was a correlation between time since vaccination and the incidence of breakthrough infections. First, this study is just a preprint and an unusually brief one at that, meaning that it hasn't been peer reviewed and it hasn't been published. And it's, to be honest, it's not even clear that someone has confirmed their calculations. But what the authors do claim here is that there was a 53% increased risk for breakthrough infection among individuals who received the second dose of the Pfizer vaccine in January or February, as compared to March or April. Now, a major problem with this kind of comparison is that we, we cannot assume that there were no differences between those two groups. After all, someone who gets vaccinated early may have reasons to be more worried about COVID. You know, maybe they have a high risk chronic medical conditions, or maybe they have a high risk occupation, or maybe they just don't like social distancing and they saw the vaccine as a way to reestablish social connection safely. The authors attempt to adjust for some of these factors, such as age, gender, socioeconomic status, and a variety of chronic diseases, but they, they did not control for occupation, and there really is there's no way to control for unmeasurable differences in behavior, like how often do the study subjects eat out or take public transportation or attend a party or wear a mask? You know, there, and there's also the issue that the authors focused on the relative risk reduction or risk increase, uh, which is, as people who have watched my videos on appraisal of clinical trials know, focusing on relative risks suggests that the actually important absolute risk reduction was underwhelming, which was the case here. Because although a 53% increase sounds pretty big, 
The fact is that the vaccines remained incredibly effective, even in those who were vaccinated at first. And there's also the issue that the relative proportions of the viral strains have changed over time. As the Delta variant, which appears to be more contagious, increases in prevalence, it makes it more difficult to tease apart that factor from waning immunity over time. But in short, even if we accept this line of evidence at face value, that immunity has slightly declined over time, that does not directly support the use of a booster. It would be, um, as a comparison or analogy, it would be like a pharmaceutical company trying to get a new chemotherapy drug for melanoma approved by leading off the discussion with a study showing that melanoma incidence has increased over time. You know, just because the situation is bad or because the situation is getting worse, that doesn't mean that your particular intervention is going to help. So I feel really underwhelmed about this entire line of evidence, which was the first third of Pfizer's application. The second major line of evidence Pfizer presented was a continuation of their original phase three trial in which just 312 of the original 44,000 study subjects were given a booster at least six months after the second dose of their original vaccination. The application states that all 312 were subjects who had been originally randomized to the vaccine rather than placebo, but it otherwise doesn't describe how they were selected or of how many who were initially selected either couldn't be located or actually turned the offer of a booster down. So that's, that's kind of a problem right off the bat. Also, of those 312 subjects, six were excluded from the analysis because they were mistakenly given the wrong booster shot. You know, one for a different SARS-CoV-2 variant. You know, I suppose we should be glad that Pfizer was honest about such a stupid mistake, but it still does not inspire a ton of confidence. Another important point here is that all 306 remaining subjects received the booster. There was no placebo at this time. So what did they use as a control? They used the same study subjects data from after the second original dose, what's known as a historical control. The use of historical control is not necessarily wrong, but it depends on the outcomes being measured, which was one of the major problems with this study. The reason a historical control could be used is because the primary outcome was the level of anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies that the vaccine stimulates. This phase three trial of the booster showed that the booster elicited similar antibody titers in these individuals as had occurred after they had received their second dose. That's kind of it. You know, they didn't look at rates of COVID infection or hospitalization or death or anything like that. Just what happened to the antibodies. This is what is called a surrogate endpoint, meaning it's an easily quantifiable endpoint, but is not one of direct clinical importance. However, it stands in for something that is of direct clinical importance. So in other words, the assumption is that bumping up antibody levels with a COVID vaccine would lead to enough of an increased immunological response that it would decrease the risk of COVID in these subjects. But that's a big assumption because antibody titers, they're not a good surrogate for immunological response. You know, there's a lot more to our immune system than just antibodies. It's just that antibodies are the thing that's easy to measure. Another major problem with the study is its size. While Pfizer reported that the incidence of side effects were similar to that seen with the second dose, 306 subjects are not enough to determine the incidence of rare but serious side effects. For example, what about the observation of the mRNA vaccines, including Pfizer and Moderna, really leading to myocarditis, particularly in young men? Since this has been observed to be more common after the second dose of the vaccine, it's not unreasonable to suspect that it may be even more common after a third dose. Yet, assuming the increased risk of myocarditis is not orders of magnitude higher with a third dose compared to the second, it will almost certainly be low enough that it's not going to get picked up by a trial involving 300 subjects, particularly when the majority of those subjects were not young men, the typical demographic for this particular side effect. So in short, instead of conducting a large traditional double-blind randomized controlled trial of the booster with a clinically meaningful endpoint, which was what was done for the vaccine's original authorization last December, for the booster, Pfizer conducted a small, not clearly randomized, sort of controlled trial with a suboptimal surrogate endpoint and which was underpowered to detect rare but clinically meaningful toxicity. So... Uh, why did Pfizer think this would be okay? I mean, 
Shouldn't they have realized that this would be insufficient? Oh, it's because the FDA said back in February that it would be okay. And, I, you know, I wish I could say I was surprised that the FDA would, would tell them ahead of time that this would be okay, but it's actually consistent with the evolution that the drug approval process in the U.S. has been undergoing recently, in which new treatments are brought to market faster by streamlining the approval process, meaning using weaker and weaker data. Again, for the record, this was definitely not true of the original EUA for the vaccine last winter, but it's certainly true for this booster application. And the third of three lines of evidence that the booster application uh, included was so-called real-world data on the public health impact of boosters. You know, this term real-world data is something else. You know, it, it, it sounds like it's somehow superior to the alternative, like the difference between in vivo versus in vitro data. But what real-world data really means is data that was collected outside of an experiment or a clinical trial, which has the consequence of the inclusion of biases that are difficult to identify, and if you can't identify them, you can't control for them, as we'll see here. Now, once again, Pfizer cited a study in Israel where the Ministry of Health initiated a booster program for older adults and those with immunocompromised in July on what seems like zero evidence whatsoever. Um, what they found was that individuals who received a booster were less likely to subsequently contract COVID as compared to adults who had received the first two shots but not a booster. As with the first study I mentioned, the authors controlled for age and gender, but there are a ton of things that cannot be controlled for. You know, as prime evidence for this, substantial additional protection from COVID was seen within one day of getting the booster, which is far too quick to be physiologically uh, plausible. So there was something inherently different about the Israelis who took the booster versus those who did not. And the study had a very short follow-up period, so there's no telling whether the, suppo the supposed benefit that was observed is long-lasting enough to be meaningful. Plus, the study only looked at the elderly and those with immunocompromise. It did not look at relatively healthy young and middle-aged folks. So in summary, the three lines of evidence for the booster that Pfizer presented. First, immunity may be waning over time. Okay, probably. Two, a tiny poorly designed study of 300 subjects showed that the booster boost antibody counts which may or may not have clinical relevance, and which may or may not come at the expense of relatively uncommon but serious side effects. And third, boosters superficially seem to reduce breakthrough infections in older people and those who are chronically ill, but we don't know how long that effect lasts, and even that observation seems to have been confounded by some unidentified factor. In short, that is not enough evidence to justify the broad authorization for a booster shot of the Pfizer vaccine in all adults. And the advisory panel made the right call here in turning it down. What's bizarre is that the strength and robustness of this application, it was the complete opposite of the original EUA application for the vaccine last November, which as I mentioned before, was a very large classic double-blind RCT with an exceptionally significant result. Now, unfortunately, the FDA, it does not need to follow the advisory panel's recommendations. You know, that would be unusual, but not without precedent, as evidenced by the FDA's highly controversial and probably quite wrong decision to approve a new Alzheimer's uh, drug this past June. If the FDA were to authorize the booster shot for all adults, despite the advisory committee's recommendation to the contrary, like, my gosh, like, this was this would be so profoundly harm their credibility that I don't know how physicians or patients alike will be able to trust them moving forward. You know, you think too many people are vaccine hesitant now. You know, a move like that would be catastrophic for combating vaccine hesitancy. Yet, it, it kind of seems plausible, you know, given how much political pressure there has been to move forward with a booster plan. You know, after all, the White House had announced that the broad distribution of boosters would start not just in the future, but would start specifically on September 20th, and they had announced this a month ago before the FDA had even started reviewing booster-related data. The political pressure on this has been so bad that two career FDA officials resigned, apparently because of it, including their director of vaccines research and review. As I indicated at the very beginning of the video, you know, I definitely do not want to create fodder for the conspiracy theorists. But it does certainly seem like excessive political influence in what should be a decision based only on science. 
I don't think anything nefarious is going on, you know, here where you know, the Biden administration has some type of major financial conflict of interest or other conflict of interest with Pfizer. But I do think that some people in the government, perhaps Biden himself, and some prominent public voices during the pandemic, including on social media, they've not been sufficiently critical of the COVID dogma. Some folks have been so pro-vaccine for the last nine months that they've failed to apply the brakes when the policy started getting in front of the data, as it has been in this case. After a, six to, uh, after a 16 to 2 vote recommending against the booster for all adults, the panel did hold a separate vote in which they unanimously recommended it for those over 65 and those at high risk of severe COVID. I feel a little ambivalent about that recommendation, to be honest. You know, while most, if not all physicians I know, believe that boosters will, at least at some point, have a favorable risk-benefit balance in that population, I still don't think the data supporting it is there. But it's a sure thing that the FDA will concur with that recommendation, so the Biden administration will get a partial win on that. It's just, you know, it's, it's just so incredibly disappointing that the FDA is not requiring Pfizer to do a conventional, large, randomized, controlled trial of the booster with a clinically relevant primary outcome. You know, I know that I, I sound like a broken record about that, but that's really the only way to know if boosters will be a net benefit. Anyway, that's my unadulterated hot take on the Pfizer booster application and yesterday's hearing. If you think I've misread the data or you disagree for some other reason, feel free to explain why I'm wrong. Um, however, before you conclude that I'm off my rocker here, you should check out the recent Lancet viewpoint against current broad use of boosters, uh, at least use of boosters now at this time, uh, that argued some of the same points I did, though probably more eloquently. Uh, I'll put a link to that in the video description below.